Good afternoon. We welcome you to the closing worship service for annual gathering 2022. Before we go forward, some announcements. First off, oh, can he use this other mic? Please let's not have your Wi Fi on because that could interfere with all of our other systems, particularly the Zoom that we need so much. But after the service is over, be sure and put it out on your social media, right, Jim? Yes. Okay. So, communion. Uh, you, hopefully, you've got kits, the little kits. Uh, and I am told that some of you are quite familiar with those. The bread and the juice are contained in that same unit. There's a very thin purple film that's the top that covers the bread. At communion time, peel that away first. Then after you partake of the bread, you can peel away and get to the juice. Okay, there will be our usual meditation, prayer, song, and during the song, you can partake. Offering, a little different. We will be having an offering either online or we have two plates in the back and Jim or Jesse will tell you a little bit more about the offering at that point in the service. Again, we're glad that you are here with us today. People of God, we've been separated for too long, separated by the great pandemic, separated by the distance, by your grace and mercy, God, our bonds of faith and love have remained. So now, last year, together again, gathered to do as the people of God have always done to worship. We give thanks, the Lord, that you have sustained us in this time. We give thanks that we last and see each other face to face in the same space. So come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout out to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God with thanksgiving and praise with music and song. For the Lord is the great God. We are God's people gathered now to worship. <laughs> That's okay, because God gave me my shortness. Okay, my feet touched the ground today, and I'm good. So, join me in prayer. Creator of all things holy, all things unholy, all things good, bad, and indifferent. Creator of all of us. Creator of this day, of our sunshine and the clouds that grow the night. We want to thank you just for our breath that is in our lungs today. That we can pray. And we can pray. And we can sing. And we can praise your love that we can stand and shout and say, I am a child of God, and I am worthy. We thank you for bringing us all together after two years of just chaos, but also a two year of learning and loving and reaching out and being the church outside of the building. We thank you that we stay connected. We thank you that we get to have church camp this summer, and we had it last summer. And we thank you that all of these folks are here that are eager and willing to be family in Jesus. We thank you. Oh, Creator, we thank you. I ask that you hear this prayer of 
for the St. Francis of Assisi, that is my favorite. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon me. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Oh, divine creator, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. It is in forgiving, it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born into eternal life and we celebrate. We celebrate Jesus Christ. And thank you, Creator God, for this day. Amen. 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 You are invited and have to stand if you are able and join and sing our songs of praise and celebration, starting with the Rise Up Praise. Romans 31, 35, or it's going to be 39. We're reading from the, uh, the message. So, what do you think? To God on our side like this, how can we lose? God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son. Is there anything else he would be glad and free to do for us? And who would dare table with God by messing with God's shows? <laughs> who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. No trouble. Not hard times. Not hatred. Not hunger. Not homelessness. Not bullying, threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sticking with sin does. They put us off one by one. None of this faces us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God. Love, because the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Amen. You've probably heard that section of the poem, The Cure of Troy by Seamus Heaney, that says, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history lie. A few decades ago, I was the director of women in ministry for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the United States and Canada. And my job, my ministry, was to support and advocate on behalf of women in ministry. To meet with seminarians, to meet with women who are who were uh, aspiring to ministry to help regional ministers understand why they ought to be called to be pastors of congregations, 
to help search committees every now and again understand that there probably was a woman who was qualified, called, sent, even to hear a call to be a regional minister. Maybe even one day, the general minister and president of the church. And in 2005, we called and elected and installed Sharon Watkins to be the general minister and president of our church. She was the first woman to serve in a large communion, mainland communion, as head of communion, that's church before the head of the denomination. In 2017, we did it again. And so, as far as I can tell, and I've been a church bureaucrat most of my ministry, as far as I can tell, there have been only two women who have been leaders of a mainline denomination, and we have both of them. Yeah. The Reverend Teresa Ford Owens is the current uh, General Minister and President of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. If you heard her last night, you know about her enthusiasm and spirit and love for this church and for the people of God as we consider what it means to be in covenant with God and one another. As we consider what it means for us to be church together. She's going to break that down just a little bit more today. We were blessed last night. We will be blessed today as we close this, this time of, of worship. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for the gift of you for this wonderful annual gathering. So welcome, Terry. We're glad that you are with us. And uh, hopefully you, you can see me. I am uh, coming to you live from downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> uh, some of you may be transplants from Tennessee out there. Um, the reason that I wasn't able to be with you in person this weekend is because almost three years ago now, I committed to the First Christian Church of Chattanooga that I would be with them for their 150th anniversary, which we were supposed to celebrate in 2020. And of course, we all know what happened in 2020. And we thought we'd be able to do it last year. And that didn't happen. But um, thankfully, I will be with them live uh, tomorrow during their worship service. They're going to rededicate at Memory Garden. And so I, I, I drove uh, down today and um, was on a board meeting uh, for a family foundation before I jumped on. So a lot of things going on. Um, I'm glad I was able to, to uh, provide the sermon to you via recording. And actually, for those of you who are members of First Christian and Concord, uh, the Reverend Dr. Leslie Taylor invited me to share a sermon. So I will be with you uh, in worship uh, virtually, and I hope that um, that message is a blessing to you. I'm so grateful for your regional minister, the Reverend Dr. Latanya Tony Bynum. Um, many of you may or may not know that she currently serves as the president of the College of Regional Ministers, and uh, so grateful for her leadership, for her friendship, uh, for her support. She has certainly been one of those who has come along both beside, behind, and all around me. Uh, in prayer and just sisterhood and colleagueship. And I know that you all are blessed uh, to have her and her life partner, uh, Dr. Leslie Taylor, uh, dynamic duo there, uh, serving together in ministry in your region. So they are dear friends. And I have to share this little story. They were able to connect me with one of my most favorite gospel singers of all time, Shirley Miller, who wrote a song called um, God Knows What Is Best For Me. That song was recorded in the 80s and has spoken to me over my entire life, long before I acknowledged a call to ministry. And because of that connection uh, with Leslie and Tony, I was able uh, to not only meet Shirley Miller, but uh, she sang it at a worship service that I attended. 
um, and gave me an autographed copy of that CD. And, um, so I just, you know, I don't fangirl over a whole lot of people, but I fangirled over mother Shirley Miller. Uh, if you Google this song, God knows what is best. Shirley Miller, uh, the lyrics will bless you. My husband sang it when I was installed as general minister and president. So, um, thank you guys for, for that. And I also want to acknowledge the moderator of the Christian church disciples of Christ, the Reverend Belva Brown. Jordan, who I understand is there and has done some workshops and uh, Velvet will be the longest serving moderator in the history of the, <laughs> of the Christian church disciples of Christ. Uh, sh she signed up only for uh, four years, two as moderator elect and two as moderator. And because we had to cancel general assembly in 2021, the entire moderator team agreed to stay on for two more years. Uh, so what that means is that Belva will have served on the moderator team for my entire six year term. Uh, and I, I couldn't, God did that. Uh, God gave me uh, a friend, a mentor, uh, a wise and kind soul uh, to journey with and someone whom the whole church loves. And so grateful for you, Belva, and thank you for all that you do for the church and, and for me and, and the other leadership of the church. Well, I'm glad that uh, Tony picked up on my enthusiasm from the sermon last night, and <laughs> I'm not going to be with you long, but I do want to unpack some things um, because there's so much going on in the life of the church. And sometimes I feel like I am being repetitive about things, but I have to remember that not everyone is in all the meetings and not everyone is in all the board meetings, not everyone is in all the conversations. And as we move towards uh, General Assembly in 2023, um, we are seeing really a shift in the life of the church in terms of how we gather, how we um, discern and dialogue and, and deliberate with one another. I understand that you have uh, participated in the Covenant Conversations uh, curriculum. Uh, the governance committee of the general board uh, started meeting regularly in 2018. Uh, all of our general board committees historically have met once a year, right? When the general board meets. Uh, after prayer and discernment, uh, and we've had a couple of retreats in those last few years, and now that committee meets as a whole every month and parts of it meet about every two weeks. I'm in a governance committee meeting. I feel like every week with one part of it or another. And as we've been discerning um, how we can indeed bear witness, right. To God's limitless love. Um, the idea that we must reaffirm and understand and really light a fire underneath ourselves with this idea of being a covenant church because covenant is an expression of love, right? Um, Jesus established a new covenant between God and God's creation uh, when he instituted the Lord's Supper. Jesus uh, is the very expression and incarnation of God's covenant of love with us. And while our polity is to some confusing and strange and decentralized and Lines of authority are not clear. Somebody said to me once, yeah, disciples are allergic to authority and accountability. I hope that's not true, but I think we do have a complex relationship <laughs> with, those, with those concepts. And so as we think about covenant, um, we have to really, it begins at the table, right? Where God's limitless love is expressed for us. Everything I think we understand about our faith and what we believe must begin with what we believe about God. And that's why it's so important to, to use all those words that, that many of us learned in Sunday school. I remember being um, excited to be able to say the word omnipotent, right? All the omni words, omniscient, omnipotent. God is all powerful, all seeing, all loving. God loves unconditionally. And so if that's the God that we serve, then we place the idea of covenant into that context and we place the whole realm of possibility on the table because with God, nothing is impossible. And with God, there are no limits. 
uh, Walter Brueggemann talks about uh, prophetic imagination. And one of the things that he says in the introduction uh, to the, it was the 40th anniversary. That book is now probably close to 50 years old, but he talks about getting inside God's imagination. So if God's imagination is limited, uh, then nothing uh, can be impossible for us. And, and we have to really grab hold of that. I was um, in the hair salon the other day uh, in Chicago. I have hairstylists in Chicago and in Indy because I just move around like that. Uh, and women, you know how it is when you have find somebody who can do your hair. It's like this emotional connection. And so if you have to change up, it's, it's really difficult. My hairstylist in Indy had a stroke during the pandemic. And so I haven't been able to get to her as often. So I went back to a guy who uh, in Chicago who famously has done Michelle Obama's hair. I want you to know um, But we were talking. It was the first time I had seen him since I became GMP. I had told him before about, you know, I was taking on this new ministry, uh, praying with him. Uh, he's about to retire 67. Um, and he is very politically active, uh, very justice oriented. His shop has always supported Brian Richardson's organization, the Equal Justice Institute in Alabama. So, so Ronnie is his name, uh, my stylist. And he talks about justice issues with everybody. And as we were talking, he said, you know, Terry, I'm an atheist. And I knew this before. And I said, yeah, Ronnie, you told me that. And he was asking me how things were going with the church. And uh, I'm always using whatever little opportunity I can to talk not only about disciples, but about God. And so when he said, I'm an atheist, he's a gay man who's been in a, a long-term relationship with a wonderful partner who helps him manage the shop. Their plan is to retire and they have a place in Costa Rica. They're planning to go there and, uh, use their money to work on different environmental justice uh, issues in Africa. I mean, this, this is just the kind of person. But he talked about coming to church as a child. His mom made him go to church. And he uses uh, church language. He has all the phrases. He even talked about the woman that he's hired to um, uh, manage his shop after he retires and things being in divine order. And I said to myself, knowing that I was going to be preaching to you tonight, I thought, man, what has separated him from the love of God? This man, because of who he has defined himself to be, has been hurt by people who say that they love God. Mm -hmm. This man doesn't go to church anymore. He's kind, loving, using all of his resources to do all the things that we say we should be doing as the people of God. He cares about poverty and racial injustice and environmental care. We could put him on numerous boards and committees within the life of our church. He would be a strong giver to his congregation he would be a loving and kind colleague and co-labor in the vineyard of God. But something, and probably someone, has behaved in such a way that he has been separated from the fellowship of Christians and chooses to identify himself now as an atheist. That hurts me. It should hurt you. There are so many people who are out there. Uh, some of us are boomers and some of us are uh, the parents of millennials and Gen Xers. There is a world out there that is struggling to find truth and peace and love and belonging and acceptance. And even though we say as Paul does in Romans eight, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We behave in ways that obscure that message for people. 
because it's hard for people to accept that God loves them unconditionally when we don't. That's right. That's the only reflection of love that they, they can see. If I'm mean and ornery to you, and then I turn around and then invite you to church. <laughs> if you saw me cussing out the drive through person at McDonald's because my order was wrong. And believe me, customer service is one of my bugaboos. <laughs> I can, you all pray for me because I, sometimes I'm like, what's so difficult about these things? What's so difficult? But I'm always mindful that someone, there may be a disciple, that McDonald's worker might be a young person who grew up in a disciple's church. I'm mindful that everywhere I go, someone might run into me again, or if they know that I'm a minister, the way in which I interact with them, the way in which I treat them in just conversation and just basic courtesy may have an impact on what they think of the church and even more importantly, what they think about Jesus Christ. So your attitudes and your limitations, your rules, um, what can separate us? We, the, the scripture tells us that nothing can, but I want to explore for a minute the, how it is possible to obscure this truth for people. We have organizational rules and bylaws. We have attitudes about our congregations that um, cause us to think about our members. We want you to be a member and join before we even think about what you might need in this fellowship or in this congregation. You might, I, I had lots of people when I was pastoring who were, uh, had experienced disillusionment and church hurt and wanting to be engaged in the work, just didn't want to be pestered about becoming a member. They were givers. They were servants. They were loving, kind people. They just didn't want to put their name on any piece of paper or even come down the aisle saying that they wanted to join the church. What has kept people from wanting to be a part of what we do? It's all of our godless things <laughs> that we wrap around our institution. We're so concerned about this institution and we're not as concerned about how we're reflecting this limitless love of God. So what gets in the way or what can get in the way of people experiencing that limitless love is not only our personal interactions, but our privileging an institution over the kingdom. If you're more concerned about how many members you have versus how spiritually healthy those members are, yeah. how you are serving your community. Are you meeting needs in your community? I don't know if you're familiar with the recovery cafe in San Jose, California. There may be the pastor of that church may be, uh, may be there. I visited them uh, a few years ago and I pastored a small congregation. So I, I know that story. I understand all those dynamics that congregation is what we might term small, but they are having community wide impact because they saw a need and they figured out how to meet it. And the people who benefit from the recovery cafe, one of the best lattes I've ever had in my life. Let me just say excellent, excellent coffee. The, the, the way in which the people who are served by that cafe now they're, they're, they're replicating that idea. They don't care how big our church is. They're not counting our members. They're weighing them. Hmm. I always tell my congregation, I'm, we're not ready to count yet because you're not spiritually strong enough to do the work of being in community with more people than are here right now. God may be saying to us, you know what? You need to get ready for what I'm about to do. You need to get spiritually ready 
for the ways in which I'm going to use all of you in your congregations and all your ministries to reflect the limitless love of God. Because when people really see it, we won't have room. If people were to really see it and experience it, as opposed to experiencing our rituals and our institutional traditions, if people really see God, we, they'll blow the doors down. Already during the pandemic, we have seen people seeking comfort, seeking truth, and they're joining our live streams. There may be somebody who stumbled on this live stream today and, and maybe hopefully is saying, oh, Wow, that sounds nice and hopeful. I hope that's what they're <laughs> that's what they're thinking anyway. But you all have experienced this in your congregations, and you're like, "Gee, how do we how do we account for the people who are participating in our worship services during um, live stream? How do we establish relationship with them? We have digital deacons today, right? Um, churches are doing digital pastors. We're making an effort to connect with people however they come. Some of these folks may never have walked through your doors before because, they're, because we've been more concerned about our institutional health than we have about our spiritual health. I promise you, if we do the work of covenant, learning how to be together uh, because we want to, not because we have to, engaging and wrestling with the beauty of that sacred text, engaging in spiritual practices that build us up so that we're ready to um, engage with others, Psalm 1 is one of my favorite psalms, and I love it because it talks about those who um, meditate on the word of the Lord day and night will be like trees planted by the rivers of water, giving forth fruit in their season. And one of the important lines, it says, their leaves won't wither, and whatever they put their hands to do will prosper. Have you ever seen a withered bouquet of flowers? My husband, God bless him, is a gifts are his love language. He loves giving me flowers and I, I get flowers all the time. And when you see a bouquet that's dried up, if you touch it, a couple things will happen. It will crumble if it's dry or it will cut you. Now, if we're spiritually dry <laughs> and spiritually uh, vapid, if we have no depth, no, no strength, no authenticity, when people touch you or when situations come against you, you will do a couple of things. You might fall apart and we also can hurt people. Pastors and deacons and elders who are spiritually dry can be moody, ornery and unhelpful people. When we're so busy doing all the things of church that we haven't taken the time to fill up our cups, to meditate, spend time with God. I have a spiritual director and every session she says, Terry, what is God saying? Well, I can't know what God is saying if I spend all my time with God asking God for things. I got to spend time engaging and discerning from our sacred text what God is saying, time in silence listening Maybe it's music, whatever those things are. These are all the things that can get in the way of people experiencing God's limitless love and making them feel not that God, not that God doesn't love them, but we're literally impeding this ability to experience the limitless love of God. And for me, the danger is not that they won't come to our church, but that they will give up on God that they will, like my friend Ronnie said, well, you know, I'm an atheist because I can't do that church thing. Mm -hmm. Giving up on God because we have been a barrier. God's love is limitless. And what we are doing too often is putting ourselves in the path of people's receiving that limitless love. One of the important things that's happening in the life of our church right now is as we're talking about a governance we're considering how do we create an environment 
where not only can we hear from God and learn from God, but that we can have healthier relationships as we discern and as we hear from people across the life of the church. We're looking at some ideas about how to not only maybe change the, um, the rhythm of General Assembly for maybe every two to three years, but creating a network of conversation and relationships that is ongoing. Congregations not just showing up at General Assembly, but participating as General Assembly delegates all the time bringing the issues and concerns of our communities and of our congregations to the table so that the whole church can discern and listen together, so that the general board is hearing all the time what's happening. We need to be able to build the capacity to operate in a way where we always are seeing that best part of ourselves, where we always are seeing that limitless love so that we don't get in the way of people experiencing it. You see it happening now at general assemblies where people will say, well, I, I didn't agree with that, but I didn't go to the mic to speak. We're getting in the way of God's limitless love because we haven't created enough openings for people to express concern or even dissent without feeling that they're being attacked. We're getting in the way of God's of people experiencing God's limitless love because we are holding too tight to our own political ideologies. And when we're biblically literate and spiritually poor and immature, we can't discern properly whether that's really of God or if that's really just my political party or my alderman telling me what to think or believe. These are things that are so important to people being able to experience God is our health, our strength, our spiritual formation, and our capacity to love and respect one another as we dialogue and discuss important issues. There's another project that we're calling the Church Narrative Project that you'll be hearing more about, where we're going to be able to um, practice what we call transformative community conferencing with Dr. David Anderson Hooker that will go beyond just being uh, talking about anti-racism, but helping us understand that there's a wider narrative that we operate in as a church and shifting that narrative so that it's a just narrative that brings all voices to the table and doesn't privilege one voice over another. Building capacity as a church to move beyond just our institutional bylaws and engage in a way that reflects the limitless love of God, that expresses the importance of covenant every time we come to the table. And as often as we do it, Jesus says, do it in remembrance of me. It is not the frequency of the table that makes us who we are as disciples. It's our belief that everyone is welcome at the table. That's what distinguishes our movement. And if everyone can believe that they are welcome at the table, then we're doing what we need to do to reflect God's limitless love and to get out of the way and not obstruct. In 2019, our theme at General Assembly was Abide in Me. And I preached the opening sermon and I talked about how vineyards are managed and cared for. And there are stakes every time I go, there are lots of uh, vineyards, even in, in Michigan and in Northern Indiana. I went to Illinois, Wisconsin and Michigan clergy retreat of, uh, last week. And there were some vineyards there. And you saw those posts that are out there that are guideposts to ensure that the vines grow in a way that will sustain life. There's something called a cover, a green cover, the greenery that you see when, a, when the vines are in bloom. Those have to be cut back and pruned because too much of that extra stuff disturbs the balance of sun and temperature that the vines need. We're so concerned about the leafy, frilly stuff on the outside and too much of that will disturb and impact the ability of the vines, the fruit that we're called to bear, from actually getting all the spiritual nourishment uh, that we need. How do we express God, God's limitless love? Being spiritually grounded, understanding what it really means to be in covenant with one another, and working to ensure that things that we do are not blocking 
the growth of the vines that we are nurtured, the spiritual lives that God has entrusted to us, the relationships in our congregations and in our communities, we can't get in the way of God's rays of limitless love coming down to bring light and warmth to people who are seeking peace, love, and justice. I pray that as we move forward, as you move forward through this year, as we learn to live with these new protocols, I'm here in Chattanooga. There's not a mask in sight. I'm telling you, um, I have asthma. I, I will be wearing a mask. It's for me, it's not a political issue. It's, it's a health issue. But as we learn to live within all of these uh, dynamics, we've got to figure out how to be people together, both physically, but also spiritually. Let us not neglect the building up of our spiritual persons. Let us not neglect the building of capacity to truly live in covenant and to truly explore and imagine that we can do more and be more. That will look differently in Northern California than it will in Southern California. It will look differently in Sacramento than it does in Portland, Oregon. It will look differently in Illinois than it does in Florida. But if we are inside the mind of God, if we are able to spiritually plant ourselves and attach ourselves to that vine, I truly believe that God is going to give us all the things that we're asking for relationships that reflect his limitless love covenant relationships that strengthen ourselves as God's people. And from that will come the institutional health that we seek. So if you'll join with me and focus on the spiritual health so that the institution can reflect the limitless love of God, I believe that God will honor all the things that we're trying to do. God will honor all the ministries that we're trying to birth in the world. God will honor your congregation's desire to meet the needs of your community. God will honor our desires to shift and dismantle systems that prohibit people from not only having what they need, but for having voice. If you think about our church since 1969, the power dynamic hasn't really shifted. General assembly is a certain kind of animal. The general board is a certain kind of animal. That system allows certain voices to speak, but it doesn't allow as many voices to speak. And we're trying to move to an environment that will allow a system where everyone gets to speak, where everyone gets to weigh in, where everyone gets to associate with the decision-making of the church and where everyone gets to bask in the vision of what that covenant relationship can really look like. I hope you'll keep your ears and eyes open as we hear more and more about it across the life of the church. It is so important to me personally that we start with this notion that God's love is limitless. Because if that's your truth, there's nothing that any one of you can do to limit that. And if you try to limit it, then you're operating against who God is. It's for me, the gospel is just that simple. And that's what Jesus came to tell us. It's just that simple. So thank you for giving me a moment to share from the heart of God, what God has shared with me, continuing to open up that Romans eight text. God gave us that scripture for 2021, knowing that that a pandemic was coming. We didn't know how much we would need to hear that message that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And it has caused us to think and focus in on what is God actually calling us to do? And we've got to be sure that nothing that we do can separate people. Because as Paul said, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Don't you be the one that gets in the way. Don't you be the obstruction. Don't you be the one that causes someone to walk away because your reflection of God's love was not visible and present. I love you all. Remember that God loves you. And so do I and continue, continue to be the church that we say we are. God bless you. Good night.